Good morning, everyone. We have a really small crowd here. I guess after Linus's those keynotes, everyone's still there. So only people who are really interested in that came. <laughs> Just to clarify, I see Yocta experts in the back. So who is Golang expert here, or came specifically for Golang, or most of, okay, just a few. Um, just a small disclaimer, we are also not Golang experts. <laughs> so if you have Golang questions, we probably won't be able to answer that. Um, just to start, so my name is Vyacheslav Yurkov. I usually go with the first name Slava, so everyone is able to pronounce that. Um, my background is I use Linux since the years 2000 and I contributed to various open source projects, Linux kernel, trusted firmware ARM bootloader, um, and I try to maintain the overlay FS cluster subsystem in the Yocta project and OE core. And those are my contact details if needed. We do that presentation together with Lucas. Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Lukas Funke, or uh, just in brief, Lukas. Um, I have also some years of experience in uh, Linux and embedded soft systems, and um, I'm currently working for the company, for a German company, which is called Weidmüller, um, and we are contributing to the Yorktio project, to U-Boot, and several other projects. So if you want to contact me, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so I'm going to introduce our agenda today. And first of all, Slava will talk about how C and C++ applications will be built within Yocto, just to line out the difference to how Go is built, which is my part in uh, the later stage. And then we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about the dependency management in um, Go and talk about how when was Go support um, originally supported in Yocto, and what is the current state? How do you get your Go implications to run with uh, in your Yocto image, and our future plans for it? So please go ahead. Um, so why I chose C and C++? Because we we are here about talking about Yocto project, and it's mostly about embedded. I think it cannot get rough estimated. Probably like. 70, 80% is going to be C or C++ development. And before we go into that, quick overview of terminology. So what bitback is, because not everybody comes from Yocta background, some of you more consideration and go. So we have a bitback tool in Yocto, which is it's like a build system and a preprocessor, or you can say a task scheduler and execution engine. Um, so bitback parses so-called metadata or configuration data. And the tool is written in Python, um, and it uses um, as an input um, those instructions which we call recipes. So recipes itself is just a text. Oops. <laughs> what happened? Sorry. <laughs> Let me do it again. Now we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So the recipe is just a text file. Um, and a text file with the extension VB coming from Bitbag, and it describes how you build the software. Um, it also describes a set of dependencies you have. It has a specific syntax, um, which kind of looks like a mix between the bash and Python. Um, and it can also describe you not only the dependencies on the package level, but it can also describe dependencies between different tasks. So the tasks is also something uh, which Bitbag executes. So the recipe itself splits on several tasks. You can have a build task, you can have a fetch task, uh, which fetches the sources from the internet, a patch task that applies different patches. And the 
granularity is that you can uh, set the dependencies between different recipes and different tasks. So for example, you see that there is a gRPC and protobuf recipe and they, in order to compile a gRPC, you need to have the protobuf available. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to execute everything in order. So you can f first fetch the protobuf and compile the protobuf and then you can already uh, compile the gRPC. So the tasks, um, the, the Octo is able to cache those tasks in order to speed up the subsequent builds. And so called sh shared state cache. Uh, when we come back to the build systems and in context of C and C++, you have different of them. You can use just make files, order to CMake, Mason, and various of different systems. Uh, my example here is based on CMake. Uh, you don't have to be an expert here. Um, just want to um, provide a brief example that's really a simple CMake file. You build a main CPP file, which is set as add executable main CPP, and you link it uh, against the boost library. And you see the find package. Uh, that's how C and C++ tries to resolve all the dependencies. This is how you build it from command line. And that's the recipe uh, for the C or C++ project, which is doing the same thing. It builds the hello world application. And you see that depends and R depends. Those are dependencies of that application, hello world application. So depends is a build time dependencies, R dependencies is runtime dependencies, and do compile and do install. Those are tasks that I get executed by a bit peg. So Yocto has um, also a set of classes which can repeat uh, the common functions for you. And in that case, the recipe you saw before is equivalent to this one because all the work is done in the CMake class. Now, to get kind of a reference and connection between those command line, task, command line commands and the Yocto tasks. So when you have git clone, that is done by the do fetch tasks. Um, then you have a configure, uh, as basically when you create build directory and call CMake, that is handled by do configure task. When you build, it's do compile task, and then you install, and etc. So that's just a simple example to understand how software is built inside Yocto. Now, in the recent Yocto version, and the latest LTS, at least in Kirkson and further on, there is no network access and the do configure, do compile. So you can only fetch the sources one, get all the, all the network access you needed, and then there's no network access by default. So you see why that's important later. So that's how it works. So all the sources are loaded during the fetch tasks, and then they're preserved in order to speed up subsequent builds. Um, the network access outside of dofetch is possible, um, but you have to specifically enable that. So all that allows to achieve reproducible builds and speed up the subsequent builds when you need that. I think that was... Okay, so yeah. I slide over to my part of, part of the presentation. Um, here are two commit messages where Go was originally uh, introduced into um, in, into OE Core. That's right, and it was back in 2017. And um, there was uh, an additional commit what which supports um, um, the, Go, the Go module, the Go mod cl um, class. So um, my first idea was 
to line out, I, I've seen that we have just one actual Go like expert, not like me, uh, in the audience. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Go now and what, what is so special about Go in contrast to the things uh, Slava introduced. So a little bit about Go. In Go, every application is considered as a module. Uh, on the button, bottom right side of the slide, you can see the module decla declaration. Um, a module declaration is, is more or less a file which says um, what's the name of the module, what is the required Go version to build this module, and also what are the dependencies of this module. Um, so on the bottom left side of the slide, you see how the actual Go implementation works. So you have like functions and um, package declarations, and you have also like this import statement um, in the middle. For the C or C++ nerds here in the audience, it's more or less works like in include. In this case, it's um, including the quote package. So a module can be further subdivided into packages, which are like subfolders in, uh, of, a, of a module. And um, all packages and all re required dependencies are, as I said, declared in the, um, in the Go module package. So how is this, this application in this example built? It's built if you type, it's really easy to build a Go application because you go in the uh, in your application directory and you just type go mod build and it will download every dependency which are declared in the go mod file. It will download, uh, it will download the actual source code into your, into your local cache from the internet and it will compile the whole Go application into a single application. So these applications can go pretty big. I've seen applications like 50 or 100 megabytes or so. But the important statement here is it will go to the internet and it will fetch all dependencies. And as Slava said before, okay, we have no internet access in Yocto after the fetch phase. So if you fetch your, um, the application, if you fetch your Go application, which you've written in the source theory in your recipe, it will download your application from whatever GitHub or so. And if you're trying to build it, you will eventually fail. There are two ways to work around this issue, as for now. So you can either re-enable the network access into your compile phase while you're translating the module, or can use something which, co is, which is called Go vendoring. Uh, Go vendoring is uh, like a wacky way, wacky way around this problem, because when you do vendoring in Go, uh, so it's it's a more or less like a command which you type into a terminal of your when you're in your Go application directory, and it will download every dependency of your application into a so-called vendor folder. So these are the two ways around it. Um, be before our contribution to, uh, to the Yocto project. Um, just a small remark. When the original Go support was added to OE Core, um, people had already Go support in other layers, like meta virtualization and some other layers. They didn't have that problem because network access in previous Yocto releases was allowed. So everything worked just fine. You just need a Go compiler, Go toolchain, and you're good to go. Yeah, and it's uh, still, a valid, uh, still a valid way to use it, right? Yep. If you try to prototype your, your image or your firmware, and it's, it's still a valid way. Um, but um, if you try to enable reproducible builds, and if you have a, like a 10-year-old uh, uh, image or a film, uh, firmware file or whatever, uh, these modules which you download from the internet may be not around anymore. So we need a way around it. So what is so challenging about it to, to marry the way Go handles its dependencies in the go.mod file and the way Go handles its dependencies? As you've seen before, that the dependency handling in Yocto is more or less using these depends and are depend statements, and this doesn't work anymore with, with uh, Go. So because Yocto is more or less, Yocto doesn't understand your go.mod file. It's, it's completely unaware of the dependencies of your application. So it cannot, uh, it cannot fetch your dependencies, 
you cannot patch your dependencies, you cannot patch like a security holes in your dependencies, and it cannot archive the dependencies for you. And uh, it can also not discover any licenses of your dependencies. That's, um, that's pretty bad. So um, also, like, as I said, you maybe have like embedded project which are around for 10 or 20 years. And I, who, who thinks that the modules uh, from the internet will be around in 20 years? I don't think so. So how do we deal with the problem? So our contribution extends something in Yocto, which is called the recipe tool. A recipe tool is a neat tool in Yocto where you can um, bootstrap your, your recipes. And the recipe tool is aware of several build systems. So the workflow roughly works like this. You have on the left-hand side, you have, a, a, for instance, a, a repository. And this may, may include a make file or a CMake file or an NPM package or whatever. And then you put the URL of either it's local or it's remote. You put the URL in the recipe tool, and from the recipe tool, you will create, yeah, the recipe boilerplate code, more or less. It will, it will recognize your build system, and it will create the, uh, according to your build system, it will create the um, recipe files for you. So it will, like Slava said before, um, it will create a recipe tool which inherits, for instance, the CMA class. And our contribution to the Yocto project now extends this recipe tool in order to recognize Go projects. So you see here on the left-hand side, you have your Go project. And on the slide, it's my Go project. But it's, it could be your Go project. And um, the recipe tool will analyze this repository and say, OK, there's a go.mod file. I have to dig in deep into the, uh, I have to dig into the go.mod file and analyze it. and I will, uh, the, yeah, the recipe tool um, will fetch, uh, will gather all the import path. So, uh, yeah, you, you more or less the dependencies from the go.mod file. And will it, aside from the actual BB file, it will create a modules file and a license file for you. And also a modules txt file. Uh, the modules txt file, it's, um, yeah, will, we, I, I don't know if I should describe it here. It's just a minor um, sp specialty about uh, Go, how the vendoring works. But the important part is that you, if you use uh, the, this recipe tool on um, a Go application, you get actually the modules file, which contains all the, your dependencies, and the license file, which contains all the licenses of your dependencies. So. What's actually so tricky about it? Uh, tricky about it is if you try to fetch, so a, a module, a, a dependency in Go is described as a module, it's, it's more or less like a URL. So it says where is uh, the, your dependency residing? Where is the uh, source repository of your, um, of your dependency? And a little bit tricky about it is that uh, you may notice, that, okay, this is a URL, but it, it's not pointing to the actual source repository of your, of your dependency. You have to have uh, to look up this translation from the actual import path to the repository URL. And you can do it in several ways in uh, Go. You can go to the Golang proxy and say, OK, I fear you yeah, have uh, an import path. Give me the source repository. This may or may not work. Um, because not every, not every Go project is in the Golang proxy. It's, there are pretty much uh, import path in the Golang proxy, but not all. So you may get a, f a 404 error. Um, you, can go, uh, you can choose to use the Go import HTTP statement and ask, ask uh, the module URL where is the actual source repository, or can, you can use some sort of regex translation. So, um, the recipe tool, in our case, will try these uh, four ways in order to translate the import path of the go.mod file to the actual source repository, source repository URL. And in um, most of the cases, it, it works. It will also handle uh, the version commit translate, uh, the version translation. So if you're using version 1.0, 
and we'll try to fetch the actual commit which is mapped to uh, version uh, uh, 1.00 in this example. So um, let's look what you get as an output um, of the recipe tool. We have, you will first get the actual recipe. Um, here you see the source URI, which Slava also described before. It points to uh, your Go project, and uh, it will also include the license file and the modules file. In, in, and it will inherit the Go vendoring class. What the Go vendoring class is used for, I will describe later. So, as I said, you get the recipe and you get the modules file, and here you, we will see an example how this file looks like. So, all the dependencies which are, were in the go.mod file before are now in the, uh, modules, uh, in the modules include file. And um, so, Yocto has several ways to model this sort of dependencies. And um, for instance, for Py de uh, Python dependencies, every dependency is more or less like an, an, its own recipe. And here we decided to, to go for um, that we include the dependencies in a separate model includes file. Because you, you may have really much uh, dependencies. For instance, uh, Kubernetes has like 500 dependencies, I guess. So it's, um, you, it's a more clever way to include all the dependencies in the modules include file. So if we look at it, we have the source repository URL, which maps to the actual import path of your Go application. And we have also the modules, modules um, version, which we require to, uh, to make a use of the, uh, the Go vendoring mechanism later. And you will also um, get a license file, which includes the license of every dependency. So why is this important? If you're thinking about like generating an S1 for your project, uh, you also, you, if you use the regular Go mechanism to fetch your dependencies, um, the, the, the licenses after the build process will be dropped more or less. So you have to like preserve the licenses um, for later use. So you have to have them in your um, include file somehow. So I, uh, let's, I want to just get back to the vendoring because um, as I said before, the vendoring, if you remember some slides before, the, the vendoring is uh, some sort of mechanism to deal uh, with, um, with the um, fact that you don't have uh, network access, but using this uh, mechanism here in Yocto, we ex actually exploit the vendoring mechanism in order to, to download every dependency, which are, uh, which are modeled here in the modules include file, to a vendoring folder and actually make use of this vendoring during the build process. So um, we, yeah, more or less mimic the vendoring process in, uh, in our build process in Yocto. And as tests have shown, this works for like most of the projects which are using uh, Yocto. And what you get now is that uh, you're actually independent of uh, the Go infrastructure. So you're independent of the Golang uh, proxy. You're, you, you can rebuild, you can rebuild your Go project in like 10 years. You can even fax, uh, fix, uh, bug fix, uh, you can fix bugs in your dependencies. And um, yeah, you have uh, reproducible builds now for Yocto, which is, I think it's pretty neat. And you also include, you can include all the uh, license in, the, in, in your fi final image, so you can fulfill the license obligations. So you want to go with the future plans? Um, just want to add that it doesn't mean that you have to convert your project to use that mechanism. The old ways still work. You can still enable network access, or you, some people, I, the project I worked with, they just keep vendor dependencies in the repository of your project. That also works, and you still can keep using that. It doesn't mean you have to switch to that approach. Um, and this approach is still not perfect, still requires some more attention. Um, the CV check for dependencies, it's still not there. Um, we're still thinking what's the best way to upgrade your recipe in a more seamless way. Um, there's 
still one small thing missing to add the SSH support. So by default, we assume that all the links are HTTPS. Um, and last time I checked, the dev tool was also has a small issue that if you want to try to develop your project with a dev tool approach, um, there's a small path issue which needs to be fixed. So those are plans we have right now. No. Anything else? Yeah, those are references and links to discussion to possible approaches, how, how to handle that. And thanks to Bruce and uh, White Miller team for reviews and all the suggestions. Yeah, but that's all from us. If you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, do you want a mic or you, should I repeat the question? Um, so the first uh, step you said that it works with the uh, the, uh, the mod file. Does it actually traverse the whole network of all of the um, mod files that get downloaded from um, your dependency update? Um, if I get the question correct, it the go.mod file includes uh, all dependencies, like the direct and indirect dependencies. So if you if you depend on one. You can download something that has dependencies on other things, yes. so it can download the next thing, yes. and it may not it may not necessarily be represented in the the go .mod file. I mean, the recursive dependencies, probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, actually, Go changed this mechanism in one dot seventeen, I think, and before the Go one dot seventeen, it was just the direct dependencies which are uh, in the go .mod file, and um, during the process, we're trying to. To update go to or to update the project to 1.17 somehow if it works, uh, such that uh, the go.mod file will include all direct and indirect, direct, so the uh, transitive uh, dependencies. Yeah, I think I, I haven't tried it before 119. So mm. you, you tried 117 or higher? Yeah. So before that, we haven't tried if it works with all the Go versions. Okay. So um, there's also uh, there was there's also some issues with Go and um, if some, some multiple project can depend on uh, multiple versions of one given version, mm. um, it's usually handled with the uh, incompatible. So the version that it says I need this version is like the minimum. Incompatible means I can't go beyond this because you know I have I don't have support or there's a requirement. Does this handle that in any way? I think the rendering does that automatically. Yes. I, I, I saw that there were two versions yeah. of the same project, and the rendering mm. at least worked in that case. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so we're trying to emulate the rendering as best as possible. Um, and if the rendering can handle such problems, we probably also can handle this problem. So it's basically the rendering behind the scenes. So recipe tool tries to do the rendering, but just fetches them at the, um, at the fetch stage. Yeah. yeah. So it actually solves it. Yeah. So any further questions? That's a question. Yep. Um, so I was just wondering about recipe tool. Is it part of the Yocto project or is it a custom tool of yours? No, it's it's, it's part of the Yocto project. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It can handle multiple. It can recognize multiple. As I said, uh, build tools. It can re recognize uh, build systems. Yeah. C, yeah. C tools, auto tools, uh, npm kernel modules, and whatever. Okay. So before that, it was part of DevTool, I think. Uh, DevTool is. is a different tool. Um, mm -hmm. It's a more tool for development uh, workflow. It was somewhere at the end. Um, yeah. yeah, so recipe tool is when you want to create a recipe or a skeleton for your project. It doesn't mean that it will work right away. So Lucas probably mentioned that you still need fine, some fine tuning when you want to use that. Um, but DevTool is a, is a different tool. It's when you want to um, create a working copy of your project with all the sources and just work in there. So that's a bit different approach. Yeah, I can expand on that a little bit. Um, I mean, DevTool add will do what recipe tool create does. So all of the logic that has been added here in recipe tool will be 
uh, used when you do dev tool add on something. It's just that uh, you'll additionally get a copy of your sources or uh, it'll utilize your source tree if you tell it where it is uh, and build from there for as long as you want it to. So you can, you can set up a, a development environment, basically. Yeah, so correct. So, so one of the dev tool called recipe tools behind the scenes, yes. Exactly. Just dev tool add and dev tool create probably. I don't remember the exact. Dev tool add, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Thank you. So if, if you uh, are putting in a recipe for a Go project, which already does vendoring, have you had any thoughts about how to, to get the uh, license handling, CV handling and all of that in place, mm. or are we just, well, out of luck? Yeah, if you're putting in, if you run the recipe tool on a project which actually has the vendor folder, mm. uh, I think we're currently, yeah, more no, or less it, ignoring it. It will fail, yeah, yeah. So you have to remove the vendoring. Mm. Vendor yeah, pro okay, so, yeah. so then the step would be to remove all the rendering and then. Yeah, if you this. have that on repository already, yes, yeah. you have to drop it so that recipe tool can handle that. Yeah. Okay. Further questions? No? Yeah. Then thank you for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>